Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. You can take your seats. Can you guys hear me? I don't think so. Can you hear me now? Does no. that there. Now you are. That's weird. It like waits a while. Okay, I'll just shout. I have a teacher's voice. I'm good. Okay, so um, thank you guys so much for coming to our first of many artist lectures at Trinidad State College. Um, we plan on doing this once a month um, into the future for as long as people are interested. So thank you so much for being here, the first of many. So today we have Rich Alford coming and um, showing us his work, giving us um, some information about what he does. So thank you so much. Uh, and I think I'll just try to project and not use the mic. Uh, thank you, Professor Riley, and thank you uh, who have come to listen. Uh, as a child, I was not aesthetically inclined. I paid no attention to clothing. I was not really tuned into the visual world. But it wasn't too long later I started to get some interest in uh, art. Let's see. That's, that's, that's Okay, find the right. Let me go back. Pardon me. As a young adult, I took some interest. I took a sculpture class as a freshman in college. I uh, tried a little bit of painting on my own. It was a terrible disaster. But I had an older brother who was an artist, and he put art on the map for me. I was able to watch his career develop and watch him and learn from him. And so I was always aware of art as a profession and a career. Uh, but I didn't feel like I had any ability to draw. And uh, in 1990, I picked up a book uh, that you may have heard of called Betty Edwards, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. It's a classic in the field, and uh, she makes lots of arguments about neurophysiology. I don't know if she's right about those at all, but she's got wonderful techniques to help people learn to draw. And essentially, what Betty Edwards does is teaches, teaches you that it's not a matter of drawing, it's a matter of seeing. Uh, that all of us can draw. She says, if you can write your name, you can draw. That's easy. You have to see what composes the world. You, instead of seeing what's out there, you have to see how things look. And it's a whole different way of seeing. And uh, I looked at that book. I scanned it. I bought a copy a couple days later. And right away, I could draw, almost immediately. And uh, my very first, uh, well, let's see. There's, my brother taught me a way to draw uh, that you project a slide onto a wall, put up a piece of tape, a piece of paper on there, and trace. And I thought, oh, I can do that, right? Any dummy can do that. So I did a few of those before. But finally, with Betty Edwards' advice behind, under my belt, I could make a portrait, and it would look like the person on the very first try. And I gradually had to work at proportion and details, but right away I could make a portrait that looked like somebody. That's my mom. Uh, I took uh, some art classes. I took a painting class and a drawing class. That's my very first painting ever. It's a little 11 by 14. And uh, I started learning about art in every way I could. I bought textbooks used so they're cheap. Uh, I uh, went to workshops. I visited museums and galleries all over the world. But art for me was a hobby. Uh, my life was as a sociology professor. Uh, but that made it possible to do whatever I wanted. And so I wasn't uh, worried about making money. I could do whatever kind of art I liked, and I didn't care if anyone liked it. I kind of hoped they did, but I didn't care. And most of my subjects, I used photographs. And partway through, I discovered I was a crummy photographer, that I had no sense of what made a good photograph. But luckily, I had a wonderful teacher, my older brother, the artist who couldn't draw himself, he is a wonderful photographer. He's twice won the top prize in nationwide photo contests. And what I do, I basically followed him around. Uh, and we go places together. And every time he raised that camera, I took up my camera. <laughs> and just by imitating him, I started to pick out what made a good photo. And then he taught me a lot of the tricks of the trade, uh, how to use a polarizer to get a deep blue sky. Uh, with high, on a high pressure day. How to use a polarizer to saturate colors and get much deeper, richer colors. He taught me how to compose with the camera. So you didn't compose later in the dark room by cutting. You composed right there with the camera in, in your hands. And I learned a lot from him. We took trips together. And over time, maybe about five years, I became a good photographer. And uh, uh, 
I, I really do think I am a good photographer. <laughs> I'm not so sure about myself as a painter, but I know I'm a good photographer. But along the way, I acquired something else that wasn't quite so positive. I acquired my brother's obsession. He's obsessed with getting good photographs. He wants the best ones and he wants them now and, and he won't put it down until he gets them. I got that obsession. I have been at a fork in the road where I literally was paralyzed. Do I go this way or that way? I know I've got great light, but uh, this way, then I can't take the pictures over there and that way, I, you know, it's like, what do I do? <laughs> and so it's become uh, difficult to, to deal with that obsession. Uh, but one of the things he taught me was to be ready, to have my camera with me. And occasionally I've missed wonderful shots that I knew that if I only had that camera, I could have been on CNN the next day, and I didn't. And then I've gotten some shots too that I was really proud of. Now, uh, two years ago, I woke up to frozen fog, and it doesn't occur very often, but this day, all the trees were white, and the clouds cleared, revealing a high-pressure, dark blue sky, and right away, I got my camera and rushed out to the golf course. I thought, where can I take nature with all that whiteness, with that beautiful blue behind? And it took me a, a mile walk to get to the course with the prettiest trees. And my hands were cold, the temperatures were in the teens, but I got some beautiful photographs. One of these won a, a prize in our local photo contest last year. So I learned to get that camera out there, to take it with me, to not put it down, and to be ready for the unexpected. Now, two springs ago, I heard a heavy knock on my door at about 5 a.m. Uh, I rushed down to find out what's happening, and it's a neighbor, and his house was on fire. And uh, I called the fire department, they were already on the way, and I grabbed my camera. And as I did so, I felt a bit guilty. <laughs> I knew I was taking advantage of this terrible, terrible moment for my friend. Uh, by getting some good photos, but I knew there were going to be good photos to be had. And so uh, right around the corner, here's this two-story house totally engulfed in flames. And I got some wonderful shots, and I knew fully that uh, they would be on the front page of the next day's newspaper. <laughs> and they were. And so I felt really bad about it, but I, I knew that I just didn't want to pass that opportunity up. So I try to keep my camera with me a lot. I try to take it. I try to be ready. Uh, now, a couple of years ago, we had a full lunar, or pardon me, a full solar eclipse, and you couldn't view it here uh, in its full totality, but up in Wyoming you could. And so uh, we took a group of people up in the near Casper, and uh, it's hard to photograph an eclipse. You can't look through the camera at the sun because it's too bright. It would hurt your eyes. But you have to get that little object in your lens properly in order to get that photo, but you can't look through there. So it's real tricky. <laughs> that uh, period of totality, as they call it, it's only five minutes, a brief five minutes that the sun is completely blocked out. Well, I've had to spend three of those five minutes find getting this photograph. <laughs> and so my compatriots, they all were enjoying the experience and taking it in and just loving the, the whole feeling of it. I only got two minutes of that. I was busy getting this shot. <laughs> but later I shared it with them, and they, they were glad I did. But it made me realize there are times to put that camera down and just experience the moment and don't always be obsessed with pho photographing. Sometimes yes, but learn when to put it down. So I try to be ready. Anytime there's a great sunset, a great uh, uh, rainbow, um, Every time we have a large snowfall in Trinidad, I get out there first thing in the morning, try to beat all the other people before there are any footprints on the sidewalk. I get down to the river. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the soft. It's on the river walks right down by the waterfall. And uh, you couldn't have gotten that two hours later. You had to get there early. Uh, the coal miners uh, right there by the uh, birdcage on Main Street. So you can get some really neat stuff. This is a partial eclipse that I, I was able to photograph. Now, this is not my photograph, but my wife's. We were on a walk about two weeks ago, and uh, uh, there's a moose. And unfortunately, my photos focused on these flowers and not on the moose, and the moose was uh, fuzzy. But my wife got this good one, and we've been so glad she did. The moose are hard to find. How much time do you have to get the shot? About two or three seconds. They don't hang around long. They take off. And so if you're not ready, you don't get the shot. So we actually practice 
carrying not only carrying the camera with us, keeping it on on so it doesn't take a couple seconds to turn on. And sometimes we even practice. It's like, how fast can you get that up there and take that shot? <laughs> so we're ready. We're ready. Now, uh, some things you might think are easy to photograph. They're not. I have a cherry tree and an apple tree, and they have beautiful blossoms in the spring. But to get the best photos, you need a deep blue, high-pressure sky in full sun. you got to get everything just right, the flowers at their peak and uh, the sky at its deepest blue to get that contrast. So uh, I try to get there. Now, uh, before I came here, I spent 34 years in Oklahoma. And it wasn't my favorite landscape. It was for my job. I love my job. I was okay with Oklahoma, but I learned to enjoy the environment. If you've ever seen redbud trees, they're beautiful. And this is a, a tiny little painting of a redbud with oaks in the background. Uh, they come out every spring, and uh, dogwoods come out every spring. And I bought a little piece of land and uh, was able to photograph those dogwoods and those redbuds. There was a waterfall on this property. It was a beautiful little piece of land. It's what I miss most about Oklahoma. Uh, the roads, this is really typical of their dusty back roads. But my wife and I, every year we'd come west during the summer and we really enjoyed the Rocky Mountains. This is a, a little lake photo. Uh, that's called Witch's Point. Foggy morning at Witch's Point. I kind of like that title. Uh, but we, my wife and I bought a home here, an older home. And it's got a traditional staircase. And along the staircase, what do families do? Family portraits. Well, I wanted to put my own spin on the idea. Rather than photographs, I uh, put uh, uh, portraits, oil, pencil, pastel. Uh, but I've got about 24 family portraits uh, along there. That's my stepfather getting his law degree. It's my sister, one of my nieces. That's my mom. Now, when I did that portrait, my mom was getting old and she had arthritis and her hand was resting on a um, water bottle, hot water bottle. But she, that made her look infirm to her. And so I knew not to put that water bottle in the painting. I knew to substitute a book under there instead. And she loved to read. She loved books. And she was much happier with that uh, portrait. That's myself and my wife on our wedding day 27 years ago. <laughs> I heard, oh, <laughs> that's a little blurry. The, the painting is actually better than that. This is a tiny little four by six portrait I did of my brothers and sister and brother-in-law and niece. So some of them are fine grain, some are loose, some are real casual, some are detailed. I like doing all different kinds. This is my older brother, the artist who I learned to photograph from with his uh, little baby daughter. She's now a grown child, grown young woman, same girl. It's my nephew, struck it rich, was one of the first employees at Amazon. Five years after that, he got stock options worth $9 million. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't need to tell you that, did I? Uh, this is a little nephew I have who's a, a wild terror. We thought nothing would ever calm him down. The army found a way to do it. <laughs> we thought nothing would tame him. This is my wife for, with our niece when she's a little bitty. And then I got out old photographs. I like doing old photographs. So this is my dad as a child, maybe eight or nine, with his sister. And peeking through the window of the house is his little brother, uh, who later, later died tragically. And so I love doing old photos. They just have this nice sense to them, old black and whites. This is a niece uh, of mine. And this is a goddaughter of mine. So I've got this whole uh, two walls of uh, family portraits. Oh, that's my, my older brother working with some kind of art project. Now, uh, I, like to, I love to do portraits, but sometimes I just feel like doing something and I don't have a subject. And so I go to Time Magazine and do famous people. And they're kind of fun. Uh, and if I want to do a fine grain portrait, I'll use pencil. Graphite is the only way to go because you can get such fine shading and such detail, and you can get it right. You can erase when you make mistakes and go back and tell you got it right. I don't know if you can tell, that's Bill Clinton, even though it's just a tiny part of his face. Mark Zuckerberg, can't, you know, everybody knows him, huh? Uh, Christine Lagarde, I think she's a European female financier, or I can't remember her title. 
Can't even remember this guy's name, but he was in the State Department. But I like the portrait. Uh, Dick Cheney, remember him? And uh, what, what I enjoy even more than the graphite portraits are portraits where I use a pen. And you, with a pen, you, you just can't be careful. You just have to kind of pick a line and make it and go with it. And so they're looser. They're not as accurate. But they kind of have more drama, more style. And then over the top of the pen, I'll use uh, some acrylic uh, for some shading. That's uh, Edward Teddy Kennedy before he died. I'm sure you recognize that, or I'm hoping you do. Robin Williams, that was about a year before his suicide. And if you look at his eyes, doesn't he look like a man who's depressed, who's not long for the world? I think it comes right through in the eyes. Now, Betty Edwards, um, I think she's wrong about the brain. I think she's right about drawing. One of the things that I always remembered what she said is that to get a portrait with a real likeness, you got to get the eyes just right, get the nostrils just right, and the central line of the mouth. And if you get those three parts, that's the best way to capture a really good likeness. And I've always tried to remember that and try to do that. Uh, this is a Japanese anime artist. Uh, a lot of students knew who he was. I didn't know who he was. I just liked the portrait. Uh, this guy, he's an actor. I can't remember his name. He played in Fargo. Poor guy. <laughs> Do you, you recognize him? That's the guy. And in Fargo, if you remember, it's kind of funny. They keep asking him, well, what do you look like? And they said, well, he's funny looking. How? Funny looking how? Well, he's just funny looking. <laughs> and I always felt for this guy that that was his central description. Funny looking. <laughs> now, these last three are, are just men, but they were miners that trapped underground in Chile a number of years ago. And uh, I just like this style. So I, I get in there with pen and do the pen part, and then get in there with acrylic and do the shading. And uh, uh, they just make for very strong portraits. And uh, so I just like these. Now, portraits of any kind have very little commercial value. Uh, but the only people who want to buy your portrait is your mother, right? <laughs> and she may have more than she wants already anyway. Uh, people don't want their own portrait. They don't want their... And so they have very little commercial value. Uh, but they're fun to do. I just enjoy doing them. Uh, they're, they're fun. Now, one of the other things I learned from my older brother is he liked to drape his wives or girlfriends, whichever he had at the time, with sheets and photograph them. And he did some wonderful photographs this way. This is a painting where I draped my wife in a sheet to, to, to give it a try. And uh, this is another one. Uh, this I actually draped her in a wet sheet, so it stuck a little more. And I think it's got a, a nice feeling to it. You, you look at it, you don't even know quite what it is. It's like, oh yeah, I can see a shape of a female under there. And this is my favorite. This was a dry sheet. I lit it with harsh light from one side, got straight above her, and took this straight down. I just think that's dramatic. It's one of my favorite paintings. Um, now, I do portraits. I do all kinds of things. One of the things I experiment with occasionally is abstracts. Abstracts are tricky, very tricky. And so I've tried many different media and styles. Uh, this one here is an alcohol ink. That's an interesting uh, way to do abstracts, another alcohol ink. Uh, I've also used uh, acrylic paint in gel medium, uh, and that, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and sometimes I, I do some drawing elements as well. Go here for edit. Oh, don't need that. <laughs> uh, see these two circles? That's a motif that I've been using for 30 years, and now I'm using it in stained glass. So I try abstracts, but abstracts are really tricky. I probably do 12 of them for every one that's good. And a lot of them, it's just boring, 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 boring. Great! <laughs> so you never know. Uh, now, once I learned to do draw, the first place I wanted to depict in the world is a place called Vitavu. It's a part of a national forest up along I-80 between Cheyenne and Laramie, Wyoming. And it's a big area of giant granite boulders. It's the kind of formation we have here in Colorado as well. And it's the place I love most in the whole world. And uh, I grew up just loving that place. Uh, just To me, the rocks were like castles. It was so mysterious and interesting. And, and when I was a child, my dad would hook up all the kids on a rope and, and take us to the top climbing. And we just loved that place. Uh, but it's a, 
it's a, a national forest. It gets hundreds of visitors a day. So in 1980, my dad and I uh, discovered that we could buy land just like this, only more beautiful. And we bought a 35-acre parcel of land just south of the Colorado-Wyoming uh, border. And it's land just like Vitavu, only it's ours. And it's incredible. It goes up about 500 feet in elevation. It's huge granite boulders, uh, fir trees, ponderosa pines, aspen, bear, moose, mountain lions. Uh, it's it's great piece of land. Uh, and so I've been painting it for 40 years now. This one's all black and white. And I've told my nephews, I said, if you can find the place on our land where these rocks exist, this painting is yours. And it's a big uh, three by four footer. They can't find it. You know, it it's, it's a long ways away. They haven't found it yet. But I've, I've got that challenge out to them. Now, these rocks, I love their volume. I love their shapes. I love the sense of solidity and heft that they have. And I just love kind of making them feel three dimensional. Uh, the rocks themselves are granite, and so they're underneath they are a peachy pink color, kind of like my skin. They're my, they're my color. But the surface of the rocks ends up being covered by uh, five different kinds of light, lichen. A light green one, a dark green one, a gray, a black, six, a yellow, as bright yellow as a pencil, and then an orange, as orange as, as a can't think of as <laughs> orange as what, but the, they're beautiful lichens, and so they're all textured. Now at the top of the rocks, this is a, a, a way up at the pinnacle, a limber pine. This tree is probably 10 feet tall. It's probably 150 years old. Way up there, they hardly grow a year, and uh, they just grow a few inches a year and get bent over by the wind. I love that one. The rocks light up uh, golden in sunset light, so you kind of wait for the good light. Um, this one's called Cap Rock, 8,000 feet. And I've just been doing these so many years, I just don't get tired of, of painting them. This one is my only best of show work ever. <laughs> and so I really thank the judge for giving me that one. Uh, this is called uh, Foggy Morning at Shower Rock. Right behind these rocks is where my wife and I take uh, showers uh, while, when we're camping out there. We had a nephew, the little one who the army straightened up. He said, I can't take a shower there. We said, why not? We said, somebody flying over in a plane will look down on me and see me naked. <laughs> we told him it'd be pretty small. It didn't persuade him. So I can do these rocks real loose. I can do them tight. They're just fun. Now, that kind of gives you a feeling for the lichen. So the rock itself is a peachy pink, and then it's encrusted with all these different wonderful colors of lichen. Uh, they make wonderful photo subjects. I'm sure I'll never get finished painting them. Uh, and right over the rocks, this is our view from the porch of our cabin, huge cumulus clouds form, very reminiscent of what happens right over Fisher Peak here on so many summer days. Have you ever noticed that the cumulus clouds often form right there over Fisher Peak? It's exactly like these. They go right there for some reason. That's where they form. Now, uh, what else do I paint? I've got nostalgic feelings from childhood about lots of things. Vidavu rocks one, but another is cottonwoods. Cottonwoods to me always represented shade and quiet and peace and protection from the sun. And I grew up in Laramie, Wyoming, and all of the streets of the town were lined with cottonwoods. That's the only deciduous tree that would grow there. Nothing else would grow. And uh, so they just, to me, represent protection and peace in the old neighborhoods. And then when you get out on the prairie, co the cottonwoods follow the streams right down onto the plains. And right under that hot plain, they bring shade and water and protection. And so I love them. And I love them individually. I think they are often great shapes. An artist friend of mine in Oklahoma, he said, they're the trees with holes in them. And I thought, well, what do you mean by that? It means they have holes in the shape. So many trees are dense. There, there's nowhere you can look through. So they're the trees with holes in them. And I love them as individuals. And I love them in groups and compositions. This one's near Gunnison. And uh, we have wonderful cottonwoods around here. Wonderful. That's a ba, bos, b, bosque de oso. I'm not quite sure how to say that. That's the wildlife area along Highway 12 out to the west. This is in the fall uh, along that road. 
These are trees on Road 13. If you've gotten up Highway 12, right before you get to Stonewall is Road 13, County Road 13. It's a beautiful road. You can often see elk. It's got some beautiful views of the mountains. And you can see this wonderful stand of cottonwoods from there. These are some cottonwoods down on the Chama River in New Mexico, uh, right near where Georgia O'Keeffe had her headquarters and home. That's a beautiful spot to photograph. And uh, this is a set of cottonwoods that my brother has been photographing since 1989. They're about 10 miles south of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And they, you can't tell it from this, but they are giants. They're just some of the biggest ones you'll ever see. And they're these beautiful shapes. And uh, people have discovered them. And so you'll often find people there photographing, sometimes flying dr drones around them, photographing from the air. But my brother's been photographing them from the very same vantage point for since 89, and then he puts these together in a series he calls Same Place Another Time. And so you can see the trees, the leaves changing, and then falling off, and then the new leaves in the spring. And he, he gets close enough photograph that you can dissolve from one into another, and it looks like the tree is just changing season. And he's been doing these for all that time. And he and I, each year uh, we get together in mid-October, and it's when the cottonwoods change color, and we drive all around Santa Fe area uh, to all of his favorite cottonwoods. And we take a photo tour and photograph them all. And every year I have a file, a mid-October, same trees, same photos. It's kind of fun. Some of the old ones, you can see them falling down, disintegrating. Cottonwoods are also beautiful when they line a stream. And this is along the Rio Grande River. Rio Grande River. <laughs> this is along the Rio Grande <laughs> I'm eating my tuna fish along the Rio Grande River. Uh, this is uh, uh, along the Rio Grande by uh, Black Mesa, if you know that mountain. It's sacred to the, the natives there. Uh, this is uh, near Salida last uh, September when we had all the smoke. You could barely see the mountains. I just love the way the cottonwoods then just form just shapes. They're just volumes, uh, very little detail. Uh, I just love the way they look. Uh, see the chamisa? I kid people that in New Mexico, one out of every four landscape paintings has got a chamisa in it. Chamisas only bloom two weeks a year. How could they be in one out of four <laughs> paintings in New Mexico? They just love them. They stick them in. I stuck that one in. <laughs> it wasn't there. There's was another little bush, and I thought, oh, a chamisa would be prettier. So a little, uh, a little poetic license there, a little artistic license. Uh, now, these are a set of cottonwoods near Mount uh, Blanca Peak. Uh, that's near Fort Garland in the little town of Blanca. Uh, one of my favorite photo spots there is just outside town, just west of Fort Garland. There's a big fence and a trail, and you can stop and take photos through the fence. And there's a beautiful set of cottonwoods right in front of Blanca Peak and Little Bear, Ellingwood. I've been painting that for years now. These are some cottonwoods up along Sangre de Cristos near West Cliff. Uh, and of course this, as you might guess, is our own Fisher Peak. Now when you come to uh, Trinidad, as an artist, you gotta try Fisher Peak. And if you're in a gallery here, everybody says, where are the Fisher Peak paintings? <laughs> so I've got a few of my own. And uh, I love the cottonwoods. Again, they're just shapes, just these big shapes. Uh, but I like doing uh, Fisher Peak. It is so identifiable. Uh, this one's got a horse, more cottonwoods. And the Fisher Peak, when you do a mountain, it's like drawing a face. Once you've drawn lines once, you remember those lines again. It's not like you've got them all locked in there, but you recognize them. It's like, oh yeah, I know the. So like Fisher Peak, I can draw it without looking at it. Uh, now the Sangre de Cristos, as we all know, are not easy to get a good look at. They're beautiful mountains, but with the foothills in front of them, they're hard to get excellent vantage points. As I drive up 12, it's like, where's a good picture? Where's a good picture? The best one I found is over a fence in private property. And every once in a while, I'll hop that fence and take that picture, but <laughs> I'm afraid I'll get yelled at. <laughs> and it's hard to get those mountains. Now, one of the things that happens once or twice a year that I love is we'll get a big snow in those mountains, and then the next day we'll get a high wind and a sunny sky, and it carries that newly laid down snow way up you know, hundreds of feet in the air. Now, 
just estimating, I say that's got to be two, three, four hundred feet in the air, that snow. And if you can get the right angle, you can get some really nice photos. I sold one of these, a bigger one, not long ago. Now, also up uh, Highway 12, if you've ever noticed that beautiful little adobe church uh, to the north when you're just about at New Elk Mine, uh, I love... This is not my best painting of that. Uh, the best ones I've had are sold already, but I love to paint that church. And uh, it's a beautiful spot, a uh, beautiful spot. Now, again, if you're going to be an artist in this area, you have to paint the Spanish Peaks. Everybody says, Spanish Peaks, try those. And so I've been painting them for years and from all different vantage points. And uh, this is along a, called Indian Creek Road. It's just outside of La Vida. It gives a beautiful angle on those mountains. This is right from uh, I-25 as m my wife is driving the car, right? There's a brief moment. You can get a pretty good view there. And this is my favorite view of West Spanish Peak. This West, 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 no, East Spanish Peak, I'm sorry. Uh, that's right at this edge of the cemetery in La Vida. My brother, one of the things he taught me is find vantage points. Find the most beautiful spot to photograph any given subject. And this is right at the edge of the cemetery. It all lays out. It's a beautiful field of grass, trees, the sangre, or the sangre is off to the right, the Spanish Peaks off to the left. It's the best view of those mountains. Uh, that I know of. Now, to the north, uh, Greenhorn Peak, uh, Greenhorn Mountain. And Greenhorn is uh, not a 14er, doesn't get a lot of attention, nobody pays any attention to it. It's hard to access, you have to access it from the north. Uh, but it's a beautiful wilderness area, and I love the shadows that form over those mountains in the evening. And I'm coming back from Pueblo after having dinner up there, right? <laughs> you guys didn't come back, you go shopping, go have dinner up there. Now, one of my other very favorite uh, subjects for uh, painting and photography is the great sand dunes. And the great sand dunes are a wonderful subject. There are subjects that are really hard to paint. They're just so detailed. And this is one of them. I, I haven't done that many really good paintings of the dunes. They're so tricky, so much detail. If you've ever known anybody who painted the Grand Canyon, same thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's great to photograph. Painting, it's a nightmare. All those ridges and all this, you know, whoa, <laughs> how do you do it? But let me give you some tips on the great sand dunes. For years, I visited at the wrong time and was disappointed with my photos. Then I learned the right time. The right time is two hours before sunset. Two hours before sunset. Whatever sunset is, two hours before. Uh, what that does is the sun is at the right angle that it lights up the ridges that create the mountain. Here, this, so it lights up those ridges. Now, if it's higher, it won't light them up. Lower, it starts to disappear too. So you got to get there at the right moment. I thought those ridges always existed on those dunes. They don't. They are a transitory phenomenon. Uh, if you have a big snow or a rain, it washes them out and the dunes are all smooth and they don't have that wonderful texture. And it takes weeks of, of wind to build them up again. So you, you can't go after a snow or after a big rain. And uh, once you get there, all the crowd goes straight up to high dune. You can't do that. You got to go left and find your own space. So you can get in dune areas that are untrammeled, uh, untouched by human feet. You don't want footprints, uh, or at least for my photos, you don't. And so you got to get there, get away from everybody. It also helps to have a high pressure sky, a big dome blue sky like this, or they get beautiful cirrus clouds over there and they get beautiful cumulus clouds. So this one, that's my wife, you can't tell, but beautiful cirrus cloud on the dunes. And uh, when you get the right lighting conditions, every detail of the, that texture lights up and becomes prominent and uh, the photos are, possibilities are just great. I love this one. Look at the detail. To me, it's like fingerprints. It's like the dunes have fingerprints. Okay. So getting it all right is not easy, but that makes it worthwhile when you do get it all right. Uh, oh, there's another one. It's kind of dark, but I like that one. Now, on the way to the dunes, you circle around uh, Blanca Peak. Whoops, oops. Let me mention this first. 
the dunes are wonderful for creating these absolutely sensuous lines, beautiful curving lines. I just love that. Woo! <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, now, on the way to the dunes, to get there, you go by Blanca Peak. And uh, I mentioned I had a little bit of land fever in Oklahoma and decided I had to buy some land. I've been driving over there, photographing the dunes, and I look for land around here. Can't find anything under 35 acres under about 40 grand. And uh, I didn't want to spend that much. I found land over here for, for under $10,000 for five acres and with the beautiful mountain views. Now this, the, it's a little fuzzy. The painting is actually clearer than this. This is on my new piece of land. And uh, uh, you're looking about a half mile to the base of the mountain. That's all it is, half mile. And then they go from there up 6,000 feet to the peak of Little Bear Peak. And uh, when rain comes down, it comes down through Blanca Basin here, comes into a creek, and then comes right across my little piece of land. And uh, so not only is this going to make a wonderful place for me to paint for the rest of my life, we also discovered what's there? Wild horses. <laughs> and so that's a real fun discovery. Oh, this is a, from Fort Garland. Let me get to the wild horse. This is one of the guys I've met recently, and uh, he likes me because I feed him. <laughs> and so although they are technically wild horses, they're not that wild. Uh, if they think you have food, they'll come up and nose around until you give it to them. He likes apples. He likes carrots. I think he may have some donkey in him, or uh, that mane doesn't look quite horse-like, but, but he's the most uh, the eager to, to meet you when you meet him over there. And they had a couple little ones. Obviously, this is photographed. But so now I'm going to be doing some horse art, too. I never even thought of it before. But I'm going to give my uh, try at, at some horse art. Now, uh, once my wife and I came here, we learned a new skill. And we took a course here at Trinidad. Uh, junior college and we took a course in stained glass uh, over in Linda's building and we really enjoyed it and uh, I've been doing I've done probably 150 stained glass since this time and uh, we're going to do a, now we are the teachers we we've taught a couple courses we're going to teach one this fall one next spring and it's real popular and I do geometric shapes, I do big ones, I do renovations, but I also do these little bitty simple compositions that all they are is a handful of pieces of glass thrown together, and they are just fun to do. I've got a great big light table, and I get all this glass together, and I just put pieces together until I like the way the colors look together. And then I cut them and stick them together, and, and uh, these little things, this big, $30 is what they'll go for. And they're so much fun. I really enjoy them. But then I also do uh, geometric compositions. Uh, I feel like uh, as an artist, I'm not going to use designs made by other people. So I've never done this design anybody else produced. I produce them all by myself. So a lot of them are geometric. But every once in a while, I take a geometric design like this, and I'll feminize it, right? Meaning what? I'll take every straight line and make it curved. <laughs> so that's what this has happened to it. It's been feminized. It's been curved. <laughs> Every straight line is now a curve. And they're just enjoyable to do. Uh, they're really fun. And uh, as I mentioned, I do renovations for people. I do transom lights. Those are great to do because we have so many transom windows around town. And all you get is light through them. You can't see a view. And so they're wonderful to bring in some real strong color. And so I've really been enjoying the stained glass art. Now, stained glass is completely different than other art mediums. It's physical, right? It's, you, it's tactile. And, and so when I get paint, tired of the, the detail of painting, I like doing something with my hands. Uh, you have to watch. You, you, you cut yourself a bit, right? <laughs> no matter what you do, you cut yourself. But it's just such a different way of putting together color. It's all discrete shapes, discrete colors. So it's a whole different way of thinking about composition. And uh, when you're composing like an abstract, you're always thinking, do I want colors that match and fit together? Or do I want colors that contrast and kind of vibrate against each other? And so you try to pick out the right combination of complementary and then contrasting uh, to, to, for whatever you're looking for. I kind of like that one too. Now let's see. Uh, are, are, are we doing okay on time? 
Okay. Then this next part, uh, I don't have slides for. Uh, it's a, it's about being an artist and and art. Okay. So there. Are, so I'll just leave this up because it's pretty. Now, uh, for years, art has been a hobby for me. In the last year, it actually became a business. My wife and I are now partners in the Marketplace Gallery here on Main Street. And uh, uh, I always said for years, like about 30, I said, I love art and I hate the art business. Love art, hate the art business. <laughs> and so now I've got, I'm in the art business. So what do I feel like now? Well, the art business on this level, I actually, I like. Uh, I don't feel like we're exploiting anybody. We're charging low prices. We're not just selling to rich, snobby people. And uh, I've been enjoying it. But I don't think it's a, a good career for most people. Uh, I was mentioning that my older brother is an artist, and I've watched his ups and downs of his career all these years. Uh, he worked for years teaching art at a community college as an adjunct. That's, uh, you get exploited as an adjunct. I, I don't mean that in a bad way, but they pay hardly anything, you have no job security, and you often don't get much respect. Full-time professors get respect and are often paid pretty well. I was paid well, but adjuncts are paid badly. And, he, and so then he, he moved to Santa Fe, tried to jumpstart his career, got into a gallery. His peak, he sold a quarter million dollars in paintings. That's a lot of paintings. But he only made half of that. He made 125000 in his best year. Since then, it's been all downhill. Now he is well below the poverty line and lives on $850 a month in Social Security. And it's kind of a cautionary tale. I don't mean that every full-time artist is going to end up like that. But there's no pension, no benefit plan. If you stop selling, things can get bad pretty fast. Now, when I look at Trinidad today, I don't think anyone in town makes their living from art, except maybe as a professor. I think not a single artist, and we've got some good ones, makes a living at it. Not one. Not even close. Uh, all the talented artists supplement what they live on through art. They have other things they do to make money. Uh, now, being in the gallery, though, has been fun. I enjoy talking to people, meeting people interested in art, making contacts. I've been selling about three paintings a month and maybe two stained glass, which is pretty good. And I bring in about three to six hundred dollars a month. Not nearly enough to live on, but nice extra money. And uh, uh, it, it's a little embarrassing to admit it, but every time I get a sale, there's this surge of pleasure. <laughs> it's like, yay! <laughs> and it's not the money. I don't need the money. It's just this sense that someone liked what I did enough that they actually paid for it. Uh, and uh, so I, it's a wonderful charge that, that you get. Uh, it's also nice to get compliments. And so for every person who buys a painting, maybe 10 give you compliments. And so that's nice. You realize that people do like your art even if they can't afford it or, or don't want to. Uh, but what I've, I think I've discovered since I've been retired <laughs> is I think we all need an audience. It doesn't have to be a big audience. It doesn't have to be an important audience. But we need somebody to be paying attention. Uh, we need someone to acknowledge what we do and hopefully value it. Now, I wanted to make a, uh, say a word about pricing of art. Art pricing is really tricky. Uh, one of the artists I met warned me. She said, if you get in a gallery, they'll ask you to charge higher prices. That way their commissions go up. And they'll get you into a trap where you can't lower your prices. Uh, for an artist, lowering your prices is like your stock goes down. You just can't do it. Uh, it's just too hard on your ego. So once they get you up higher, you, you can't back off when the market's down. And so it's tricky. So when you put a price on a piece of art, it's a statement to the world about your own assessment of the quality of your work. It's, this is what I think I'm worth. And so higher prices express confidence, but limit who can afford your work. So you stick a great big price tag on there and people say, oh, wow, wow. I can't buy it, can't afford it. <laughs> uh, yeah, in our gallery, uh, I don't know if any of you know Frank La Lumia. His paintings are the most expensive, and people love them, right? They say, whoa, beautiful, beautiful, can't afford it. <laughs> $1,700, nope, $2,000, nope. <laughs> so once you charge higher prices, you start selling just to wealthy people, basically. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes you want to sell to people who like art and aren't wealthy. 
Uh, but charging a lower price can undercut the public's perception of your quality. For some people, if it isn't expensive, maybe it's not that good. And so people kind of judge you on your, on your price as well. So it's a real dilemma what, how you set your prices. Now, have any of you heard this recent example of uh, President Biden's son, Hunter Biden? He's announced to the world that he's an artist, right? Well, it's kind of new, right? But he's an artist now, and he's put these outrageous prices on his paintings. And if you've seen them online, they're okay. I don't think they're great, but uh, I don't think they're terrible. But he's got big ones that he's got a half million dollar price tag on. And the art community is saying, half million dollars? That's what you charge when you're already famous, not when you're a brand new uh, novice artist. But other people say, well, if he sells and all at once, people will think they're worth that. And then they'll want to get in before the prices go up. And who knows? <laughs> but it'll be kind of interesting to, to watch. Uh, is he a great artist or does he have a runaway ego? Now, if any of you are students, I wasn't sure who to anticipate in the audience. And I thought some of you might be students. My advice for students is advice you're going to hate because you probably heard it from your parents. Have a plan B. <laughs> right? You heard it from them. Uh, have a second plan. Um, develop other school skills as well. Don't just be an artist. I met a, a photographer from uh, Angel Fire, New Mexico. She says, to be an artist, I do all kinds of things. She says, I bust my butt doing things to make money. I walk dogs. I do anything I need to do. And she says, she was the one who told me, don't set your prices too high. You can't go back. She says, have, have art available at all different price points. So if you have your big paintings for bigger sums, have prints for lesser sums, have postcards for even smaller sums, have mugs maybe, or you know, coasters, but have so people can buy your stuff even if they can't afford the, the, the big ones. Uh, so have a plan B. Now, some of you might be contemplating an MFA, Masters in Fine Arts. If you're serious about art, they, want it, they often encourage you to go that way. Yeah, now, if I go over time, just give me a look and I'll quit, okay? I hate to steal people's time. <laughs> so if you want to go for an MFA, be forewarned. What are they going to teach you? Lots of skills, how to do lots of different kinds of art. But they teach more than skills. They teach you a value system. They're going to teach you how to judge art. And they're going to tell you what your parents like, what your friends like, is crap. Or I shouldn't use that word. It's garbage. They'll say normal art is boring. The only worthwhile art is avant-garde art, innovative art, groundbreaking art, art that does something original. They are so set on that that they often see beauty as passe, as old-fashioned. You know, who cares about beauty? Uh, they want something that makes a statement, something that is innovative, and I think that has value, but I don't think that's all there is. I think beauty's important in its own right. I think portraits are great, even though no one in the avant-garde could care at all about portraits. Uh, they will look down on you if you say you want to be an art teacher. They'll say, oh no, you can't teach art, you gotta be an artist. You gotta go out there, get in a big gallery, sell paintings, and hopefully at some point in your life, maybe even make it into museums. If you say you want to be an art teacher, they'll look at you like, well, that's an inferior course, right? Don't take that course. Uh, that's what happened to me when I became a sociologist. They said, you got to be a researcher. I said, well, I want to teach. They said, no, 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 you got to be a researcher. <laughs> and so when you come out of MFA school, it's very likely that you're going to acquire that value system. Once you're surrounded by it by, for two or three years, it's pretty hard to resist it. And you're going to come out being a little bit of an art snob. Now, I hope I see I see Professor Ryling nod her head. I, I was worried about saying that because I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but it's true. <laughs> They'll teach you to be a, uh, uh, an art snob. Now, today in the world, there's not one art world. There are many art worlds. There are little mini self-contained art worlds. And if you get into these, you'll find that they all exist on their own. There is cowboy and western art, and they've got magazines and groups and societies and competitions. There's Indian art. You gotta be an Indian. You gotta be, you gotta prove it. You can't do Indian art. There's all different levels of fantasy art. They've got all these different categories. Uh, fantasy realism and, and uh, do any of you know Rodney? I can't remember what he calls his stuff. Uh, there's graphic art. 
um, I was at the state fair last week and, and I looked at the floral painting on porcelain pots. And you think, huh, <laughs> some of the most beautiful art I've ever seen and some of the most talented artists paint flowers on vases. <laughs> now to me, it's like, I, maybe I'm a snob, I look down on that, but it's like, they're beautiful. And so you realize there are all these different little mini worlds of art that exist in relative isolation. Uh, they have their own vocabulary, their own heroes, their own competitions, and even their own kind of value systems. And uh, so what's going to happen in the future in art? I think that we're going to have more of the same. That's always a good prediction about the future, <laughs> more of the same. I think we're going to have even greater fragmentation into more micro art communities. But there's also tremendous cross-fertilization. Artists are all watching each other like never before. Artists once had limited exposure to other people's art. Today, not true. Today, you just get on the internet, you can watch, you can look at any gallery, not any gallery, any museum, uh, you can study any kind of art. Everybody is watching everything today and they're learning from each other and it's making art much better, much better. Once artists were relatively rare, today every community has many good artists. We are a little town of 9,000 people. I think I know of at least 25 excellent artists in this town and I'm sure there are a number I don't know. 25 really good ones in this little bitty town. That's true for every town in America. That's a lot of good artists. And so kind of like the folks who want to be professional musicians, love it, do it, enjoy it, but don't count on it paying the bills. It may not pay the bills. Uh, I hope it does, but it may not. So I wish you good luck in your art and uh, enjoy your art. And if you're headed for a career in teaching, there's nothing wrong with that. If you like art as a hobby, there's nothing wrong with that. And don't let anybody tell you differently. I think I'm done if, that, if we're close enough. Okay. Thank you. Oh yes, question. Oh yes, Hans. <laughs> uh, uh, th thanks for the presentation. Uh, I like your landscapes. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, do you ever do any plein air? You know, plein air for me has been a total bust. Uh, and people say they love it so much, and I've tried it, but it's like the sun is constantly moving, the wind is blowing your That's canvas around. Because some of your paintings they look they have made very fast. Ah, yeah, and yeah. Some are pretty fast. Too. Yeah. So I wonder, since you work fast, you could go outside and. Yeah, it just it just uh, hasn't worked for me. And uh, uh, artists are very cautious about admit to using photographs. It's kind of taboo. It's seen as de class A, right? Less important and less. And so a lot of artists will say, "Oh, I use photos as reference, but I don't, you know." I actually do a lot of copying. Now I do a lot of moving things around and and swapping out. Cottonwoods, but I, I do use photos to a large extent. Yeah, and it, and I'd love to be a plein air painter, but so far it hasn't worked out. Yeah, it's so tricky, and everything blows over. And <laughs> Did I see a hand up back there? Or yeah, I was just wondering how you choose your the celebrities you painted. Oh, just with this face that struck me. Yeah. Uh, actually, all of them. Uh, I've got hundreds of those. Hundreds. Uh, so bad guys, good guys, ones I hate, ones I love, doesn't matter if their face looks interesting. I'll give it a try. Yeah. Uh, I, I have done a little bit with acrylics. And stuff. Oil, yeah. Uh, I painted with acrylic because my wife hated the smell of oil. And because uh, I had a tendency to get my elbows in it and track it around. But uh, oil is so better, much better for any kind of real fine grain stuff because you can blend so much more easily. But now I wouldn't go back. I, just oil only. You just have to be real careful about not touching it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. 
analytic question, just a comment on your, I know you went through your art in some past. Uh, to me, art, the art I like is something you connect with. And your landscapes and all that, it's like, wow, I want to go to this place. Yeah. I want to visit there. I want to, I want to enjoy that. I want to see the clouds two hours after the sun, before the sunset. And uh, you really capture it. You just reminded me. I, I just left out a little piece. Let me stick it in real fast. <laughs> it's like clouds. I forgot. I'll fit this in real fast. Okay, I promise. I've been doing clouds forever, and I love especially big cumulus. This is over the Laramie Plains. This is in Hawaii. This is just a tiny little painting, but I love those clouds. It's a place called Key Beach, P E on Kau Kauai. Fabulously beautiful spot. I love backlit clouds. This is over the Sangre de Cristos up by Westcliff. This is over the plains in Wyoming. Uh, down in New Mexico near Raton. Uh, I like backlit clouds. That's right out here about 10 miles uh, east of town looking back at the Spanish peaks. And uh, this one I just got a little prize for in the state fair. Uh, it's a big cumulus cloud that came over Trinidad last summer. And this cloud was so big, I shoot with an 18 millimeter lens, which is really wide angle. It took two shots to get this thing in, two photographs. It was so close and so right there. And there's a little field out there that I can go to and get only cottonwoods around, no buildings, nothing but sky and trees. And I love that, that, that giant, that monster. Yeah, so thank you for reminding me. And now I've been learning to do clouds that are more wispy and with the sun coming through. And so they're tough to do. Uh, clouds, the values are often very within a limited range of values. And everything's got to be blended right or it just looks clumsy and, and awkward. So, so I'm, I'm getting better at them. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm curious about the process of self-critique because you, you're really passionate about it and then you say, when I make 10 abstracts, not bad, like good. So I'm curious if you talk with other artists or if that's really a thing well, I'm married, so I have a built-in critic, right? <laughs> All you married folks know about that, right? And so my wife, she's my fiercest critic. And so my first effort is always to show her things. And, uh, but, and I take her advice sometimes and other times I go my own way. But I, I feel like I know what I like and, and which ones I really like. And I, I like other people to appreciate them too, but. And how do you know when it? Done. Because it, with these clouds, that's not easy. That is very fluid when yeah, done. yeah. But those are when everything looks not awkward, when there are no harsh lines, when everything's blended properly, because they require lots of blending. Thank you. Now I know some of you have wait have come here instead of going straight home to dinner, and I know what a big sacrifice that is, and I thank you very much. Uh, for coming. Uh, I know at, at this time of day, it's very hard to get any kind of a crowd. Everybody's ready to call it the end of the day, especially if you have a long walk home. Is he going to give you a ride? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you all know Linda walks most of the time. Well, fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.